Hi everyone, and welcome to the AI Hardware Show. My name is Ian Cutris, and joining me, as always, Sally Wolf Foxen. Hello. Hey, Sally. Now, in this show, we speak about AI hardware: the good, the bad, the ugly, the, the less good, the less the bad. kind of weird, <laughs> all different types, and there is more than you think. European startup Syncense has built a spiking neural network accelerator. That is, it's designed to accelerate brain-inspired event domain neural networks based on transmission of electrical spikes. As a reminder, spiking neural networks have the potential for ultra-low power and ultra-fast processing of sensor inputs. Similar to Intel OEE and BrainChip, Syncense has an asynchronous digital chip because the timing of the spike signals is what's important. But unlike with Intel and BrainChip, the spike's a single bit. The Syncense neuron is a relatively simple integrate and fire design with 8-bit synaptic weights. The neuron has a 16-bit threshold. When the threshold is reached, the neuron fires off a spike to its neighbours. Tailored for convolutional networks and used in vision systems, Syncense's multi-core design uses one core per CNN layer and the cores work asynchronously and independently. In an intention to interact demo, which looks at whether or not the user is looking at the device, the Syncense processor demonstrated latency below 100 milliseconds and with less than 5 milliwatts dynamic power consumed by the sensor and the processor. Syncense has already partnered with event-based camera companies that are inspired by the human eye, including prophecy and innovation. These cameras look for changes in the scene, drastically reducing the amount of data produced so you can use less power and lower latency. The idea is to use synergies between event-based cameras, speed and low power consumption, and the same properties of spiking neural networks. Spiking neural networks has always been a big question for me because obviously that's kind of how our brain works, but trying to put it in silicon has been really, really hard. In it is hard, way. and how do you train them? And does it even really matter if it's exactly like the brain? Who cares if it works, that's right? true. There are that's a lot true. of questions still about spiking, but I think it's super cool, which is why I've included it here. <laughs> yeah, there's some, some super cool stuff because this one I think is really cool. So the rise and fall of Intel's machine learning investments could fill an entire episode on its own. But the very first company Intel acquired for hardware was Movidius. Very early to the machine learning cycle, Movidius was formed in 2005, focused on accelerating computer vision with low TDP chips. This is computer vision before it was machine learning accelerated. The popularly advertised line of hardware was called Myriad and Myriad X, but it was the neural compute stick available in a USB form factor that got the headlines. I remember when that thing came out and you couldn't buy them for love nor money and loads of people wanted them because it was a vision accelerator on USB. The thing is, Mavidius was acquired by Intel in September 2016. Intel continued those product lines, but the marketing and messaging kind of dried up. And even after the launch of the Neural Compute Stick 2 in 2018, again, very difficult to find and buy, as well as subsequent acquisitions of in, from in, Intel of Nirvana and Habana, it was assumed that the Mavidius acquisition was dead. Not so. Coming out of those supposed ashes is Intel's new VPU, or Video Processing Unit, with the code name Keem Bay. I first saw Keem Bay in person in September 22, while I was invited to an Intel event that is in Intel Israel. On an M.2 drive, the Keem Bay VPU was listed as a separate device in Windows Source Manager, much like a GPU, and suggesting that you could have multiple of them. And the demo they showcased was improving the game streamer experience of OBS. The video workflow was added in for image segmentation, background blur, and additional AI effects. The purpose being to offload the workload to the VPU and keeping the CPU GPU for gaming quality and compression of that video stream. Intel also spoke of demos applying this to assist automotive experiences. The chip is an upgraded version from previous Movidius VPUs with dedicated AI engines, custom accelerators, onboard ARM A53 cores, and programmable processors that leverage Intel's OpenVINO toolkit. While it's been available for B2B customers since early 21, Intel is now offering it on special Nooks and laptops for the 13th generation core product line. The ultimate goal here is to integrate the functionality direct into its consumer processors, which we expect is with the next generation Meteor Lake. 
Although I've been pushing for Intel to sell these at, at retail on the M.2 form factor, I could easily see myself using one or two helping with video processing and offload. And if it helps with that game streaming base, I could see a lot of code being written for it. However, it seems that Intel wants to keep this one close to its chest. I think that's because they don't want the M.2 card being used in AMD systems. But we'll talk about that later. NVIDIA announced at GTC last autumn that it was cancelling its previously advertised Atlan self-driving chip and replacing it with Thor, a two petaflops beast of a GPU intended to centralise processing for instrument clusters, infotainment, driver monitoring, parking assistance and automated driving, all in the same chip. Putting all these functions into one massive chip will lower the overall system cost, according to NVIDIA, and simplify development. There will also be less weight overall and fewer cables. What's cool about Thor is you can do both graphics processing and AI acceleration on the same chip at the same time using MIG. MIG, or multi-instance GPU, was introduced in the previous gen Ampere products and it allows you to basically partition a very large GPU into seven small chunks and do different things with those small chunks. We've seen this before for the A100 and the H100, but this time with Thor, you can run graphics workloads in some of the chunks and AI in some of the others. Vehicle manufacturers can use the whole two petaflops for autonomous driving or connect two Thors together via NVLink if they need to, or they can split it up and use a portion for infotainment and a portion for driver assistance. With MIG, the instances are isolated such that real-time processes can run at the same, the same time as other workloads without affecting each other. Thor is built on the same architecture as Hopper, so it has the same transformer engine as the H100. We should start seeing the first production vehicles with Thor in around 2025. One of the companies in this series that aren't making a chip, but is offering licensable IP, is Quadric. Not Quartic that I keep trying to type in when I write this script. It's definitely Quadric. Quadric. Quadric claims a solution solves one of the fundamental limitations of modern machine learning workloads, that's partitioning. A modern AI workflow involves solving the graph part of the model, but modern machine learning often has separate vector compute and control flow in the mix to make sure everything runs where it should. Using Quadric IP and software stack, the company believes it has a solution that simplifies the whole process, removing the need for complex partitioning. At the heart of this is the Chimera GPNPU. That's Chimera, named after a mythical beast whose parts come from multiple different animals, and the GPNPU part stands for General Purpose Neural Processing Unit, playing off the GPGPU name NVIDIA uses for its programmable GPUs, but applying it in this case to a dedicated AI processor. The Chimera IP consists of an int8 optimized inference matrix engine paired with a complete 32-bit scalar vector ISA, with the idea being that each side can scale as much on what the customer needs. Obviously, managing multiple types of flow is difficult, and Quadric's plan here is to cover that with its compilers and framework support. The 64-bit fixed instruction length is fed into a seven-stage pipeline, where instructions are intermixed between matrix, vector, and scalar, with the company promoting deterministic, non-speculative execution. There are AXI interfaces for memory, and dedicated local register memories to support broadcast operations within a layer. This level of control, hidden from the developer, allows Quadric to claim fine-grained clock gating for power saving, though hiding up from the developer, yeah, we'll go on to that. Quadric recently raised another $10 million in Series B venture capital funding in December 22, taking its publicized total to just shy of $50 million. Until we see silicon and performance numbers from one of Quadric's partners, it's unclear how the hardware stacks up to the competition. It supports all the major frameworks, but hiding that control might be a limiting factor to the code ninjas. And ninjas are important in AI. Ninjas are important everywhere. Especially in Fuel Japan. <laughs> Startup Esperanto released its first chip last year, a data center inference accelerator with more than 1,000 RISC-V cores, one of the biggest RISC-V designs we've seen so far. This chip's designed for hyperscale data centers to accelerate inference workloads, particularly recommendation inference. Recommendation is a very tricky workload to accelerate. Uh, it's a mixture of neural network layers with huge embedding tables that require a combination of dense compute and sparse memory access, unlike almost any other mainstream AI workload. To tackle this, Esperanto has designed an AI-optimized vector and tensor unit which takes up most of the chip's real estate, including a custom multi-cycle tensor instruction for large matrix multiplication. 
The whole design is geared towards energy efficiency. These chips are intended to go on a dual M.2 module um, to fit onto OCP Glacier Point cards. The power limit for that form factor works out at 20 watts per chip, so Esperanto have done some aggressive low power design. All 1000 cores run in the same low voltage domain at 0.4 volts, which is below the voltage you normally need for SRAM to work properly. So they've added more transistors to the SRAM to make sure they get robust performance. They also trimmed switching capacitance by using lean RISC-V cores with a minimal instruction set to reduce the number of transistors. Overall, each chip is capable of between 100 and 200 tops, depending on clock speed. And then you fit six of those into a module. It, onto the cards, the bigger cards. Yeah, I, I remember seeing it when they, when they announced it. Uh, I was thinking, ah, they've got a, de a very specific design point. But we'll get onto that, because if you didn't already know, after each episode, we do a more freeform style podcast. It's a where, chat. It's a chat. Slash rant about <laughs> what do we really think? Unscripted. We cover the same six companies, but more freeform. So stay tuned for that if you didn't know already. So when we first started writing scripts for this series, we looked at our lists of AI hardware and hardware startups. There were 72 slots to fill in, in our original design. And my list was about 90. And I think Sally's was more like 150. It was a lot. Especially if you include all the smaller Taiwanese companies. However, on both of our lists, one company had more entries than any other, and that's Intel. And that's why you get two Intel chips this episode. Gaudi 2, as the name suggests, is the update to Gaudi. It's born out of the Habana acquisition, and Gaudi 2 is the big accelerator used for training. And aside from the Xeons, it's Intel's most widely deployed AI chip in the market. As the name suggests, Gaudi 2 is the second generation building upon Gaudi 1, this time on 7 nanometer, and you can even find them today on Amazon EC2 DL1 instances, or use them on-prem with an eight-way server featuring six four kilowatt power supplies. It's not for the faint-hearted. The big Gaudi 2 chip triples the number of tensor processor cores inside from eight to 24, and adds support for perhaps the widest range of floating point formats. That's two versions of FP8, all the way up to FP32 and even TF32. One of Gaudi 2's biggest customers is Intel's own Mobileye, so there's also onboard media engines to enable video processing of HEVC, H.264, and VP9 video. Because of the big video requirements, onboard memory has tripled to 96 gigabytes, and that's using six HBM2E dies and provides 2.45 terabytes per second of bandwidth. Because it's also used in training, there is also 2.4 terabits of networking bandwidth with native integration of 2400 gig NICs. The bandwidth and onboard memory being almost an exact multiple of each other is not a mere coincidence. Intel's white paper on Gaudi 2 showcases that each of the 24 processing cores leverage large matrix multiplication arrays to help accelerate training data, and that doesn't rely on a lot of data reuse like smaller matrix multiply engines would. The document states that Gaudi 2 can be 100% utilized with a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix, whereas modern GPUs split the problem up so much that you, even if you have 3x in each dimension, or a 3k by 3k, so 9x total, that only gets you 80% utilization, whereas Intel can get 1,000. This makes Gaudi 2 more power efficient with large matrices, which is more training related than inference. Gaudi 2 is relatively new and became available last year. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you might like other episodes of the AI Hardware Show. This whole series is free to watch here on YouTube. And if you want to watch our podcasts, again, more freeform content. Yeah, check it out. Then check it out. It'll be posted, this episode will be posted the day after. But if you're watching it later, then it should all be available. And enjoy, enjoy our malicious rants. Malicious, uh, malicious is maybe not the right word. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not malicious. No, it's not malicious. The opposite of malicious. Engaging. <laughs> Engaging. If there are any companies you want us to add to the next season of the AA Hardware Show, put them in the comments below. Thanks, Sally. Thank you.